Steve Adubato, Lessons in Leadership, Mary Gamba. Mary is so pumped up. I am more than pumped, show. you don't even know. <laughs> Listen, Kenny Danico, we're going to have on in about a second, um, who's a great broadcaster, a great friend, and also happens to have, all right, three Stanley Cups that he's won. Mary is a massive Devils fan. She's going to be driving this interview. Mary, why are you so pumped about having Kenny on? Uh, well, you know, it, and it's so funny. We had uh, Kenny on back with audio way back in the day, and there was a, uh, a train ride. I think it was down to Trenton at the time, and I have a picture of my two sons, Will and Joey. They were probably about five and eight at the time, and now they're 16 and 19, and a picture of them together with Ken. We've been huge Devils fans, uh, watched it, uh, watched the Devils forever, and uh, so we're just thrilled to have them on. Hey, Kenny, welcome to the show. We'll talk. Mary, real quick, tell Kenny who our sponsors are because he cares about sponsorship. Oh, I know he does. No money, no mission. So we've got Prager Metis, Valley Bank, the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825, the New Jersey Sharing Network, Seton Hall University, and the Bacino Leadership Institute, uh, the North Ward Center, and Kessler Foundation. So thank you so much to our generous sponsors for all your support. All good. Hey, Kenny, first of all, how are you doing? I'm doing good. And Mary, thank you for all that support over the years for our Devils team. I'm looking forward to the up and coming season. As you can see, once a devil, always a devil. I'm all decked out. You're looking sharp, Steve, in the suit, but I had to go with my Devils gear. I apologize. <laughs> no, not at all. Um, by the way, Kenny's got all kinds of things around him, like real championships. Like, what, what, do you, what are some of the things you have in that room and around you, Kenny? Oh, I have some replica Stanley Cups, Eastern Conference Final Championship trophies. They're all behind me, but I know we had to set up here. I've got a That's beautiful right. you, pink like real trophies. The NHLPA gave me of me in certain jerseys. So a lot of stuff in this office, but this is the way I'm situated here, Steve. Not so, and Kenny's got his jersey, number three, hanging in the rafters down at the Prudential Here's Center. Picture. Here's a picture of... Me and Marty holding the Stanley Cup. So this is an all hockey. Marty Brodeur. Here. I think I got a good picture of that, right? Oh, I yeah. yeah. My face is probably Mary, Mary, thing, Mary, for but a lot of good stuff around me. Kenny, for points of comparison, you have pictures of yourself, Martin Brodeur, championships. You got the three Stanley Cups. Let me tell you what I have of me. I have a picture of me playing in the parochial A championship game, as is Catholic, against Seton Hall, me kicking a field goal to try to win the game. That's what I have. Nice. Hey, That's how unimpressive it is. <laughs> <laughs> well, Steve, that, you, Steve. It was a winning field goal, correct? Yes, but then we lost the game in the last second. We're not talking about that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to bring back bad memories, pal. No. <laughs> and by the way, Kenny, last time I saw Kenny, our great friends Joe and Barry Marillo uh, and Vito are great friends. They had a wonderful fundraising event, a golf outing at Essex Fells Country Club. Kenny was our uh, guest of honor along with Rick Cerrone from the Yankees and all good stuff. Kenny, thank you for doing that with the, with our guys. Uh, always a great time getting together with everybody and all the officers and sheriffs and of our great state of New Jersey. And, and the Morellos are just wonderful, wonderful people. Known them a long, long time as you have, Steve. Oh, good. Hey, Mary, listen, I know you have got a lot of questions about not just the Devils, but more importantly, leadership in sports. Go. Yeah, no, definitely. And one of the biggest things we always talk about is the connection between sports and discipline and just growing. I've mentioned to you, Kenny, in the past that both of my boys play ice hockey and my oldest is now at Michigan State, uh, not playing hockey because he had to get shoulder nice. surgery because of too much hockey. Uh, but what is that connection between uh, leadership, sports, discipline, uh, you know, with coming up with children and young adults today? Well, I think uh, for any young adult or, or children or, or just um, having success in anything you do. I mean, we always correlate it, I do anyway, to sports because I played the game of hockey since since seven years old. But I just think it's so important as far as uh, uh, a teammate and you're together and, and as a team that uh, from a leadership standpoint, um, it, it's supporting each other every day, even from a young age. I, I'm a big believer, Mary, and leadership to me one big part of that is even growing up as a young young boy was you know giving my teammate a pat on the shoulder or a hug when things aren't going well sometimes we always think when things are going well and you get all these accolades that's leadership to me that's not not what it's all about for me it was always whether it was 
when I was in minor hockey or whether I was with the New Jersey Devils, when somebody was going through struggles, whether it was on the ice, whether it was off the ice uh, with the personal issues, how are you, man? Speak to them, talk to them, listen to what they're saying. And I think that starts right at a young age uh, for me. I've always been that guy and I believe her in that as far as when I was down and when I was going through struggles in my life or struggling on the ice, I wanted somebody to come up to me and say, Kenny, how you doing? Uh, and, and really uh, give me that support when needed. You know, you get enough pats on the back when things are going well. Mm-hmm. That's also great and great times. But uh, the leadership to me is when guys are struggling, that you're there to support them. Hey, well said. Hey, by the way, Kenny, um, as a great communicator, um, since you played you have had a very successful career as a broadcaster. And by the way, tell folks exactly your broadcasting credentials, my friend. <laughs> well, excuse me. Well, I'm fortunate enough to be a color analyst on Devil's Game. I don't even know now, five or six years, although I've been in the broadcasting booth with the Devil's organization since 2006, where I did analysis and pregame, postgame, and in between periods. But now I actually do the live games which is much more exciting for me because obviously you get into the action. I I wear my emotion on my sleeve. I'm also grateful to be on NHL Network for many, many years and covering the entire league so you really uh, get to know more of the teams and individual players. And it helps me in my local broadcast with the Devils on MSG. So uh, just involved in the game of hockey, grateful that I've been uh, since the day, day one of the New Jersey Devils 38 years ago when I started playing as a 19-year-old, uh, Steve. Well, the reason I raise it, Kenny, other than letting folks know where they can check out your work, is that my obsession, and Mary knows this, through the books I've written about leadership, it always talks about communication. And you know, um, because communication has been part of my world, and when I host the events with all of our guys together, you got to be on that microphone, and you have to have confidence, even if you don't feel all that confident, you have to come across that way. Here's my question to you. Since I connect leadership to being a strong, effective communicator, where did your skill set and your expertise come from as a really good guy on the mic, a guy who could talk? That's part of leadership. Well, thank you. And I I, uh, humbly say, I don't know, some days are tougher than others, as you know, Stephen, and and communication to the fans. I, I, you know, early on for me, it was always, I was nervous for sure. I mean, I always was one of those guys that had a little bit of the gift of the gab, probably talked too much, some of my friends will tell you. And I had reporters after my career, near the end of my career, that covered me during my playing days would always say, you know, have you thought of going into broadcasting because you're always, you know, pretty candid with your answers, answers, win, lose, or draw, and was able to communicate that. But they had a job to do, and I understood that uh, during my playing days. So I just wanted to stay in the game, and obviously when I – decided to get into broadcasting, uh, I knew I had to be me. I mean, I I watch other great broadcasters, whether in other sports, do football or or color analysts along the way, or baseball or hockey, obviously. And I try to emulate them at times. I got to be more articulate. I got to sound better uh, than I do at times. And then sometimes I get too confused in my mind. So all of a sudden, I said, just be me. I'm passionate come across to the fans like you love the game and relate it to them uh, as they're watching. And, and that's what I've done, basically. Steve, it's not always perfect. I know that, but Doesn't I have, have to be. Follow. Hey, Mary, there it is, passion right there. And Mary and I teach communication and coaching presentation to a lot of leaders. And we always say, tap into your passion, right, Mary? We sure do, definitely. And one other thing that Steve and I talk a lot about is winning. And Kenny, how do you uh, give people advice, right? Like to you, winning was hopefully getting those three Stanley Cups, but there's many teams, many players out there who aspire to and never do get a Stanley Cup. So how do you redefine winning? Because it's not always getting the trophy. Wow, that's a good or, question. Or is, I, it, I mean, obviously, or is it? Or is or, it about the trophy? It? Kenny, you, Mary and I have been obsessing over this forever. <laughs> I, we don't know if sports is different. We lost that state championship game, I tell you, back way back in the, in the late 70s. But here's my question. If you have a great season, the team's getting better, you're cohesive, you're working together, the morale is great, but you don't win the big one, have you lost? Well, if they, have you uh, lost? The, the saying is, if you're not first, you're last. But that's not true at all. 
<laughs> You're I, killing me, Kenny. Was, uh, <laughs> and I'm just kidding, Steve, a little bit there from the standpoint that, you know, it's a process. It, it is such a process. I came in the early 80s with the Devils when they just moved here, and we were terrible. I wanted to be part of the solution. I didn't want to go anywhere else. A lot of guys um, asked to be traded before the final product is finished. And, and I was always one of those guys that I want to be part of the team. I want to be part of something. Yes, the ultimate goal is winning it all. But it takes steps. It takes uh, learning along the way. It takes preparation, as you know. And, and obviously, there's successful seasons when you don't win at all. It's not easy to win. In fact, it's extremely hard. There's so many good teams out there. But, you know, did you give it your all? Did you mm -hmm. do everything from a preparation standpoint to a work ethic standpoint to being a good teammate standpoint to give your team that opportunity? And sometimes it doesn't work out. But you can put your, uh, from my uh, point of view, you can put your head on the pillow and understand that I did everything possible to be part of the team and help my teammates try to accomplish that ultimate goal for us at the time was winning the Stanley Cup. But there was a lot of disappointments along the way, but I never let that deter me. I, I didn't. I, I mean, I was almost corny to the fact that I'd say, when we were winning 17 games a year in the mid-80s, I would tell people, we are going to win the Stanley Cup. And they'd laugh at me. I'd say, we're gonna, I'm going to win the Stanley Cup. As Where did that confidence come from? Oh, uh, since a young kid, Steve, I always had to believe in myself. I knew I was not the most talented. I wasn't. Yes, I was pretty decent in my area. There was 10 Ken Danicos on every corner uh, in the hockey world where I grew up in Edmonton, Alberta. Uh, but one thing, I was not going to be outworked. I was not going to be prepared. And I always say to kids nowadays, and it sounds like a cliche, but it is so true. And you have to connect it with your, with your words and your heart, believing in yourself. I can do anything. I can accomplish anything. I will get to the National Hockey League. I will win a Stanley Cup. But you have to make sure you do all the things to prepare for that and be a good teammate it is first and foremost to me. Marianne, we say this all the time. Uh, in the end, if you don't bet on yourself <laughs> as a leader, how can you ask other people to follow you? Hey, Steve, Mary, uh, quickly, I, I got to go. say the story. It's speaking to that, and, and some people think it might be cocky or arrogant, when I was 19 years old or 20, 19, and the Devils were thinking of sending me back, and I can't believe I was this brash at the time. I just, I wanted to play so bad. They had all the names, name tags on a board, pins, and, and Max McDab, the general manager, late, great Max McDab, general manager at the time, said to me, Kenny, we think we're going to send you down to junior for a little more nurturing. I stood up, pointed to the board. Tom McBee, my old time coach, told the story, and it's true. I pointed his board. I said, are you kidding me? You've got to be kidding me. I'm the best defenseman you have up there. Because they weren't very good at the time. Max had to think about it for a while. He loved the fact that I said that. He says, okay, let me think about this. I might good not say for that. You. <laughs> Good for I you. I love it. Hey, Kenny, you've never lost that confidence, but also a sense of humility and giving back. Mary, I'm going to give you the chance to, to thank Kenny and say goodbye. Yeah, no, thank you so much, Kenny. And uh, just for all of our viewers out there, I know they learned so much from your passion and your enthusiasm. So thank you very much. And most importantly, let's go Devils. Uh, thank you, Mary. Thank you, Steve. Always a pleasure being on with you guys. And keep up the great work. You're doing wonderful stuff. Thanks. Kenny Danico, Mary Gamba, Steve Adubato. Go Devils. Right after this. This edition of Lessons in Leadership is made possible by the Bucino Leadership Institute at Seton Hall University. Prager Metis, Valley Bank, the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825, the North Ward Center, the New Jersey Sharing Network, Delta Dental of New Jersey, Kessler Foundation, and Seton Hall University, showing the world what great minds can do since 1856. This is Mary Gamba. If you want more leadership tips and tools, log on to stand-deliver.com. That's stand-deliver.com. Promotional support for this edition of Lessons in Leadership with me, Steve Adubato, and my colleague, Mary Gamba, has been provided by NJ.com, NJBIA, and New Jersey Business Magazine, CIANJ, and Commerce Magazine.
one of the things, talk about innovation. This series is about innovation. This series that you're about to see is dealing with research, science, innovation, and leadership. And I'm about to introduce our good friend, Michelle Pignatello from Kessler Foundation. Mary, we're innovating constantly. I'm not going to talk about us so much, but the reality is just the idea that we're doing this series is innovating lessons in leadership, is it not? It is, and it's all about challenging the status quo. So we're super excited to be partnering with the Kessler Foundation and Michelle and her team. So it's a perfect opportunity to introduce Michelle. <laughs> Michelle Pignatello is the Vice President, Chief Development Officer of Kessler Foundation. Um, Michelle, enough of us plugging ourselves. Um, by the way, tell everyone what Kessler Foundation is. Kessler Foundation is a public charity that we're dedicated to changing the lives of people with disabilities through research uh, that improves quality of life cognition, mobility, and employment. And we're also a grant maker. We fund other nonprofit organizations that are helping people with disabilities gain access to employment. Yeah, you'll see the website for Kessler Foundation up right now so you can find out more, you can contribute, you can make a difference. Michelle, the times I've been up there, I've seen people walk with these devices that uh, Kessler Foundation uh, has provided for them, the exoskeleton. They're two different types, I know. But the reason I'm saying all this is We've seen people walk. We've seen people gain memory. We've seen people have their lives changed. And my question to you is this, that's research, science, innovation, but it's also leadership. Absolutely. We need to, when we're challenging, uh, leadership is about challenging the status quo, how, how things right. are done. And so our, our researchers are looking for new ways to help people walk who can't walk, help people learn information who have lost that ability for whatever reason. So that's leadership. Um, and But in order to do that, that work, we also need support from the community. You know, we couldn't do this work without our donors. Which is why the website is up right now. By the way, Mary, let, we're introducing this interview. This is one of many, right? We're going to do, Michelle? Yep, definitely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And this is Dr. Nancy Chevrolati, who's doing really important research uh, up at Kessler Foundation that deals with memory impairment. Hey, Michelle, you're going to be joining us many times throughout this, along with our colleague and friend, Roger DeRose at Kessler Foundation. We're honored to be partner, partnering with you on this leadership, innovation, research, science, et cetera, series. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Check out this interview with Dr. Nancy Chevrolati. Nancy's director of centers for neuropsychology, neuroscience and Traumatic Brain Injury Research at Kessler Foundation. Good to see you, doctor. Thank you for having me. It's great to see you. So, so Nancy and I have been working together for many, many years. We've been doing a leadership and communication academy at Kessler Foundation for several years with our, that's set up by our, our great friend, Roger DeRose there. Mary, this part of our research, science, innovation, and leadership series. And here's right out of the box the question, uh, Nancy. In your mind, what is the connection between research, science, and innovation, and leadership? What the heck does that mean? Well, to be honest with you, Steve, I think those three concepts are really very tightly intertwined. So starting with research and innovation, when you think about research, what we do as researchers is we ask questions, we seek new knowledge, we take innovative ideas and apply them to problems or we take older ideas and we apply them to new problems, or we apply them in innovative ways. So science research is all about innovation. It's really, those two things are very intertwined. And then when you think about research and what we're doing, what we're doing is forging a new trail. We are taking an idea, we're looking for new knowledge about that idea. In much of my work, I look for new treatments so that is really all about leadership. We're forging a new trail. If it works and it's looking good, we keep going. If it doesn't work, we go back to the beginning and start all over again. And that's perfectly fine because if you're wrong, you have to be innovative to be wrong to begin with. And so you, you gotta go pivot. Something new, you pivot. So it's all about leadership. Nancy, by the way, describe your research around story memory technique. I know it because we've talked a lot about it in seminars, but it's more important that other people know about it. By the way, let's make sure Kessler Foundation not only their logo is there, but their website so people can find out more. Go ahead, doctor. So the much of the work that I do is really focused on memory rehabilitation. I wanna understand memory, understand the problems that people are having 
with regard to their memory, and I want to try to fix it. That's what my work is all about. Over the years, we've developed a treatment called the Kessler Foundation Modified Story Memory Technique. And what that treatment does is it takes two concepts, older concepts that we've known about for years and years and years, and it innovatively applies them to clinical populations hmm. to teach people how to use them to improve their memory. So specifically those two techniques within the story memory technique are um, context and imagery. So we teach people how to take verbal information like words or sentences and create a mental image of that information. And then we also teach them how to apply context. So to take seemingly very disparate information and combine them into a meaningful context and then provide visual and then imagine that context. And what we're finding is that teaching people these techniques, once people are able to learn them and apply them, they're actually showing that their everyday life is improving, their everyday memory is improving. And mm -hmm. we're changes at the level of the brain. So the brain is engaging in different regions to learn and remember information. So it's really very exciting work. And we're seeing it impact a lot of different clinical populations. So um, it's really working and we're moving ahead with it. Hey, Mary, and we thought the work we were doing was important. It, this is so <laughs> fascinating, I tell you. And, and doctor, a lot of what you're talking about is really challenging the status quo when you talk about innovating and pivoting, correct? Absolutely. Research is all about challenging the status quo. We're seeking new knowledge. We're trying out new ideas. Sometimes we're wrong and that's fine. As long as we're right sometimes too, that's, that's what we want. And we just follow down the paths that look fruitful and we keep going and try new ideas in different ways. Um, Nancy, let me try this. Um, I'm curious about something. Because we've worked together for a long time, in the Leadership and Communication Academy at Kessler Foundation. We've gotten to know each other. The one thing that has always struck me, other than your expertise and your commitment to your work, your research, is your passion. Where does that come from? And it's, and it's connected to leaders, leadership. How the heck can you be a great leader if you're not very passionate about what you do? You know, that's a great question. I think my passion comes from really enjoying being with people and working with people and seeing what people struggle with. If you talk to people in any aspect of your life, they're bound to complain about their memory at some point in time, because that's what we do. We expect to be computers and we're not computers. So even at a very young age, I was very interested in memory and helping people improve their memory because that's really what people want. We are all about our memories. That's who we are. So I think that's what drives me. I see all of these people struggle with their memory abilities. And I just, I want to see, I want to see that improve. Yeah. Mary, jump back in. You And, and Nancy knows this. Uh, along with millions and millions of other um, people in the so-called sandwich generation. We watched our dad for about 10 years deal with uh, you know, dementia. And obviously, other than the pain and the suffering he was going through, but also my mom, you begin to think, okay, so what does that mean? Genetics, me, what do I, and I can't find my keys and that's it. I'm, I'm panicked. I'm not the only one. We'll talk about that in a second. But Mary, I know you've thought about this a lot as well. Yeah, definitely. So for parents, caregivers, those that are dealing um, with family members who are going through memory impairment, how do you uh, recommend that they deal with that issue? Do, how do they approach it in a positive way while also obviously making sure to not bring more fear and concern into that family member? I think the most important thing is to take it one day at a time. So I, I'm dealing with this too. My mother has early memory loss. And so I understand it. Obviously, I understand it from a professional point of view from my entire career, but I also understand it from a personal point of view. It's heartbreaking and it is truly overwhelming. So I think the most important thing is to take it one day at a time, one problem at a time, and ask for help. You know, I'm fortunate that I have two very involved brothers that are very helpful. So 
I think that makes a huge difference to be able to talk to someone about it, even when they can't offer a solution. And then if someone can jump in and help and throw out new ideas, there are support systems out there. There are agencies out there that can offer assistance. Find help anywhere you can get it. There's nothing wrong with asking for help. Quick follow-up in the limited time we have. I've seen you progress, not just as a leader, but because my obsession is about communication and presentation and being concise and clear and effective in what we do and the way we communicate. You've improved dramatically and I hope you're not uh, uncomfortable and embarrassed by me saying that, but I remember the first mock interview I did with you on the seminar, in all seriousness, and I see you all these years later. How have you gotten so strong? Because there is a clear correlation between leadership and effective communication. How have you gotten so strong in this area? And it has a lot to do with being a great researcher and leader. I think a lot of my focus over the years, and I remember talking about this you years ago, very early on, has been figuring out how to take my work and talk about it with someone who has no knowledge in the area. That's what makes for effective communication. And I see it now with my sons. I have three sons that are 12, 16, and 17. And I talk to them about my work. The 16 and 17 year olds have a great deal of knowledge of sci in science now, but they don't have knowledge of neuroscience. So I think talking with them about it over the years as, as they've grown up has really helped practicing talking with other people about you know, what you're doing, why you're doing it, why it's important to you. I think that has all really helped me over the years. Yeah, being really smart and being a researcher and a scientist and then having to break that incredibly complex information down to people who don't have that background, that don't have experience, mm -hmm. I mean, that's tough. And that's what Nancy's been doing for a long time. Hey, Nancy, you honor us by being part of this series uh, dealing with research, science, innovation, and leadership that Roger and Michelle and the team at Kessler Foundation have allowed us on Lessons of Leadership to do. Nancy, I want to thank you so much for joining us on the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. You got Great. it. I'm Steve Adubato. That's Mary. That's Nancy. And this is Lessons in Leadership. We'll see you next time. This edition of Lessons in Leadership is made possible by the Bucino Leadership Institute at Seton Hall University, Prager Metis, Valley Bank, the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825, the North Ward Center, the New Jersey Sharing Network, Delta Dental of New Jersey, Kessler Foundation, and Seton Hall University. Showing the world what great minds can do since 1856. This is Mary Gamba. If you want more leadership tips and tools, log on to stand-deliver.com. That's stand-deliver.com. Promotional support for this edition of Lessons in Leadership with me, Steve Adubato, and my colleague, Mary Gamba, has been provided by NJ.com, NJBIA, and New Jersey Business Magazine. CIANJ and Commerce Magazine. A stroke can be easy to detect. A loved one can't speak. Perhaps they can't move. But there's another sign of a stroke that many of us can't see. It's called spatial neglect and it can occur during or after a stroke causing distorted visual movements. Fortunately, there's a solution by using optical prism technology during rehabilitation. If you or a loved one have experienced a stroke, ask your doctor about spatial neglect. Spatial neglect. See the whole picture at KesslerFoundation.org. This is the Seton Hall story, one that comes to life every day on our campus. This is the place where great minds discover, innovate, collaborate, and find their true calling. This is the place where passion has a purpose, where learning inspires leading. The bonds we make, the values we teach, inspire our community to take heart and take action. This is Seton Hall University. This is what great minds can do.